Hi everybody, in this video, we're going to continue looking at some of the improvements made to the JavaScript language as part of the ECMAScript 6 or ECMAScript 2015 set of improvements. And today we're going to look at something known as arrow functions. And what they do seems kind of weird at first, but as we'll see shortly, it's pretty cool. So arrow functions, they, they do two things. They solve two big problems that developers have been complaining about. So the first thing they solve is this. They save you some keystrokes when working with function expressions. Now, you're probably in one of two camps you're probably, what is a function expression? Or you're like, I never had any problems writing function expressions. Don't worry, we'll look at the code for it and you'll see you know, which camp you fall into. And the second thing to do is this, and this is the more useful thing that I think makes error functions totally worth the struggle of trying to learn. They bind the this value lexically. And that also might not make a whole lot of sense if you've never heard these words before, but as an example, it, you know, it's something that is a real problem and it avoids a lot of the self and that workarounds that we used to use when having functions and re referring to variables and then having the closure not have the right value and all that. Basically, this is a messed up problem. This is a convenience. So thing number one, fine. You know, I don't really care about it, but thing number two, once you can see it, you'll be like, I can't believe I can live, you know, live without it for so long. Error functions are awesome. All right, let's look at some code so we can put some of these, you know, really two bizarre things that I claim error functions solve and let's put them into actual, actual practice. So here I have a code editor. I'm using Adam. You can use whichever code editor you want. You know, I'm not really picky about it. And this is a blank page, nothing really going on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just minimize a lot of stuff to focus only on the script element. So the first thing we're gonna focus on is just the keystrokes that the arrow functions save you know, compared to traditional function expressions and just what these things look like. So let's start with the function expression first. So I'm just gonna have something very similar. I'm gonna say var foo equals function. And if you've seen something like this before, you know, it's very familiar. We have a variable called foo, and I'm initializing it to a function value. And in this function value, I just want to write some text. So document dot write line hello. Right? And to call this particular function, I would just type in foo and then use the open and close parentheses to type it in. And then once I've finished typing that in, you'll see the word hello display in our preview window. Pretty cool, right? Pretty simple. All that stuff is great. Now what function expressions do is the one of the first things they do is this. This is a very common pattern you'll use throughout your applications. And the more complex applications you have, the more instances of this particular you know, syntax you'll see all around you. So to save you some time, to save you some hassle from having to define the word function and the opening and closing bracket, especially for one line statements, you can totally do, you know, do away with that and use a function expression. So I'm gonna have var bar equals, and I'm gonna declare and use an arrow function instead. So the way you use an arrow function, at first it looks a little bizarre, but the first thing you do is you specify the arguments you need to provide, in which case you don't have any. So we're gonna have only the open paren and close paren. Then you use the equal key and the arrow sign it looks like this. So basically what you end up having is like a fat arrow that is pointing right. And oftentimes arrow functions are also known as fat arrows for the exact same reason. So what I have here is I have var bar equals, no arguments, arrow function. And what I'm going to type in here is the exact same thing I had before, which is document that right line and hello. I'm going to say hello again. And if I were to call this in the same way I would call it like before, it said it's a function. I'm going to do bar and type this in. You'll see that the word hello and then hello again is printed on screen. So what we've really done is save it a few keystrokes. You went from having to have function and all of these characters, you got rid of them all to only have essentially just the, you know, the number of arguments you want to take and the particular arrow function that essentially says, take the arguments and do something with it. The no argument, just execute whatever the statement is right here. Now, the thing is, not everything you're going to be typing is going to be uh, a single line. So the arrow functions can be, you know, written in a different way. You can actually have multiple statements in there, in which case this approach can be, you know, enhanced by using brackets. I'm going to have var zorb equals, same as before, function expression, and instead this time it's already my expression, I'm gonna have an open and close bracket, just like you might have seen before. And in all the hello, I'm actually gonna change this hello again to isn't this cool? You know, let's all pretend it is. And just like before, I'm going to call this function zorb, and you'll see that now isn't this cool shows up. And just for simplicity, I'm gonna uncomment these earlier lines, just so we have the last instance of our function is plain. So all these things are essentially a shorthand. The thing number one that arrow functions solve, they, they solve the ability to have 
less characters that you type when wanting to use them in the place of you know, the function expressions that you've seen here. Now, let's say you wanna provide some arguments. For example, you know, let's go into the function example. Let's say I wanna say hello in the name of a person, right? I'm gonna specify my argument name, and then I'm gonna say hello, let's modify this a bit, and then specify the name, and then many exclamation marks, great. And I'm gonna say hello, and let's pick a name here, you know, I am, no, Buzz Lightyear. Only saying that because I happen to have a Buzz Lightyear stuffed animal, or stuffed, stuffed character on my desk, you know, over here. So I'm gonna do this, and let me just comment out the Zorb, and just print this out. You'll see hello, Buzz Lightyear appearing, and it's because the argument that we provided is passed into the function itself, and then as we're calling the function, we are passing in an argument with the name that needs to be printed out. Great. The way you do that in the, in the, the arrow function world is pretty similar. You know, where we originally specified the open and close paren, they, like I mentioned before, they specify the arguments we take. So I'm gonna type in my name here, and I'm gonna type in document right line, and I'm just gonna copy this exact line of code, mostly because I'm just a little lazy right now. And then we just call this function just like before. Hello, I know, bar, and then buzz light here. For the print this, you now see that the argument we provided is passed in and sent to the expression here that then evaluates and then prints out hello buzz light here. So all this stuff is pretty good. And you can imagine the same exact way happens with the with the function expression where we actually have multiple statements. So we actually have the, the opening and closing brackets. So great. So all this that you've seen so far in the last few minutes is a way of showing you how the arrow function greatly simplifies the the, the suffering we all had to go through by typing in the words function and then the open bracket and close bracket and all of that. And, you know, I'm not gonna say that that's the most useful thing ever, but it is kind of nice. You know, the one thing you need to mention, remember, by the way, is that when you're having a function, the, when you have a one-line expression like this, the return value is automatically taken care of for you by the arrow function. But if you're actually using the opening and closing bracket and you have multiple statements, you must specify the return statement explicitly if you so care. In this case, I didn't, but normally it's a good idea to explicitly specify a return statement if JavaScript won't be providing one for you. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now that we got the, you know, the, the superficial change, in, in my opinion, that the arrow function provides, which is less characters and working function expressions, let's get to the part that I think is really awesome. It really makes arrow functions totally worth all the, all this, you know, all the fuss about getting them working properly. All right, so one of the biggest challenges has to do with scope. You know, we talk about scope, we talk about closures, we have, you know, this whole area where certain things work, should work the way they do, but they, do, they really don't. So let me give you an example first, and let me type it in first. So I'm gonna have a game object. It's a var game object, and it is literally gonna be uh, an object. Like it's an object literal syntax to initialize all the properties. So I'm gonna have level colon four. I'm just you know, have some code here, I'm just gonna quickly copy that in, and time 200. Okay, so what I have here is a game object, and I have three properties here, level, score, and time, and they have some values, you know, arbitrary values that I made up. And then we're gonna create this game object. I mean, it's a neat new keyword, but we all know the cool way of creating objects these days using object that create. So I'm gonna do that. So var my game equals object dot create game object. Okay, so right now I have my object created and you can see this at work if I were to do document dot write line and just do my game dot level. You'll see that, you know, the number four gets printed out because the level here. Great, I'm gonna, you know, take that out for now. Okay, so all of this works fine, but what we really wanna do is this, and I have a time property here, and I'm gonna create a countdown function that counts on a value of time from 200 to eventually a value of zero. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert a p element to allow me to essentially be able to visualize what the time value looks like at any given time. By default, it has three exclamation marks, but we'll fix that very shortly. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna declare a property called countdown, and it's gonna be a function. And this function is going to have inside it a timer, which is going to run every second and decrement the value of 200, of the value of time from 200 to one. So I'm going to show you how to do it in the old traditional function approach, and then we'll look at how arrow functions come in and save the day, you know, so to speak. So I have my countdown, I have function. So the first thing I'm going to do is this. I'm going to declare my set interval, window.set interval and inside it's gonna be another function, and this is the function that get called every second once I've declared the, specified the duration value, so 1,000. So every 1,000 milliseconds or one second, 
the function that I define here is gonna get called. So the first thing I'm gonna do is decrement the value of time. So this dot time minus minus, and then document dot query selector pound count dot inner text is gonna be the value of our time property. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you right up front, this is not gonna work as we had expected. And the reason is this. Let me go ahead and show you what it looks like. The value of this when declared inside a function is never quite the way you know you might expect it to behave, especially in the context of our game object, object literal here. So right now the value of this is not pointing to game object, which is where the time property is actually defined. It is actually pointing to the function created by the, this particular anonymous function I'm in right now. And the time property obviously does not exist here. So I need to figure out a way, uh, a different way of handling this. And the way we've been doing this particular issue, you know, solving this problem for many years in JavaScript is by using a variable called self for that or any other creative name I'd have to essentially create a closure that ends up pointing to the right value of the time property so that when the anonymous function is run, it gets the right value and then you know, does the right thing. So the way it looks like, it looks something like this, var that equals this. So I'm creating, I'm creating a variable called that, and I'm initializing it to the value of this, which in this situation is still pointing to the game object itself, or object that we care about. And so inside set interval, I just replace this with that. And I, you know, when I hit save, notice what happens at this point. You now see our value decreasing, just like we would have expected. And the reason is that this function is now pointing to the value of this, through the dat variable, which is now a closure because as this function is running, there's an outer context created, blah, blah, blah. You know all about closures from my other videos and articles, so that's fine. So that is how you know, we used to solve it in the past. And so arrow functions, like I mentioned earlier, you know, thing number two in what it solves is that it kind of does away with a lot of this, you know, a lot of this magic we need to write to make this work. It takes care of, you know, any any value of this inside an arrow function is lexical. It actually looks at the object itself, it's contained inside, as opposed to the immediate and closing function that you're currently in, which which saves us the hassle of having to do all of this. So let's look at how the exact same thing would look uh, using an arrow function. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of the var that equals this. And for I have, where I have my function declared, where window that set interval is function, I'm going to essentially provide the same syntax you had earlier, equals bracket, create the fat arrow, and now just the opening and closing brace. And instead of having that dot time, I'm gonna do this dot time like we had before. And I hit save, notice what happens here. Notice that now we no longer have to deal with the, you know, keeping track of the variables and, and the value of this at any given time in the context it is running in. But instead we just say, okay, you know, I'm in, you know, I'm in an anonymous function, I'm using the arrow function, and this is gonna point to the game object directly. And this is something that is a major time saver and it helps increase the readability of the code significantly because I'm no longer maintaining these, you know, huge list of that variables and self variables and wondering what exact value of this it is currently currently storing. So so there you have it, you know, a very quick overview of what arrow functions do and the two things they bring to the table. Like I mentioned earlier, the first thing of where it saves you a few key keystrokes you know, that's fine. I mean, the thing is, error functions have been around for a while. You can see them in other languages like C Sharp and CoffeeScript. So it's not completely new here, but I do question, you know, whether saving keystrokes is really a good motivation for it, but it is what many people mentioned. So I wanna make sure you're aware of that being an improvement. And the second item, which is really the, you know, fixing the whole scoping of the this variable or the this property is fantastic. It saves you so much time. And as you saw earlier, it is probably one of the things that makes arrow functions really useful and definitely something you should have in your, in your bag of tricks for, for later. All right, so if you found that interesting, feel free to go to crew.com where I have a bunch of articles about not just JavaScript, but a whole set of web development topics that you might be interested in. If you need any help, post in the forums at crew.com where I and others, human beings for the most part, will be able to help answer any questions you might have. And you can also find me on Twitter at Krupa and Facebook and YouTube. I'm pretty prompt about replying to things, so if you you know, ping me, expect a response from me pretty quickly. And of course, everything you see videos of is a very good chance to book out of it as well. So if you like books, if you like reading them in Kindle or paperback editions, by all means, click on the link below to see all the books that are currently going and if any books might be of interest to you. So to wrap things up, you know, if you found these all you know, interesting and useful, do tell your friends and, and enemies as well if you have any. You know, I love to hear from people on what they like and don't like, especially on 
what are some new topics to cover in the future. So the more you tell people about it, the greater chance are that we cover cool, interesting things on the site. And if you found this useful, the video specifically, you can hit subscribe and you'll be notified of new updates and new videos that go on. And the more subscribers I have, the, the cooler I feel about myself. So that's a good thing. So hit subscribe. And you can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook for, for smaller updates on things that I found on the net that's kind of cool or things that I've created or things others have created. So if you want those little, you know, micro updates, by all means, go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Facebook. And lastly, you know, buy a book. You know, buying a book helps support a lot of my various addictions and hobbies. You know, my most recent one being, you know, like, you know, I, I have multiple mice. I have one mouse here, another mouse here, and I have no idea what this mouse does. No clue. But with every book you buy, you help ensure I have many more mice to litter my desk. So that way I can continue trying to figure out what mouse goes with which device. So buy a book. All right, guys. See you next time.